So we are a group of providers who specialize in evidence-based treatment for youth uh, mental health uh, struggles, uh, specifically suicidality, self-harm, trauma, anxiety, depression. And uh, we, we've kind of sort of developed a bit of a niche for ourselves in, in that we work with families that tend to get referred to us by other clinics and centers and hospitals. So we work with a lot of high acuity, high complexity, uh, and that's kind of forced us to, to develop some, some very flexible, comprehensive sort of treatment approaches. Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of Business Ninjas. I'm here today with Dr. Ryan Madigan. He's the founder and director of the Boston Child Study Center. Dr. Madigan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, excited to have you. So why don't you start and tell me a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I'm a clinical psychologist uh, by by training. Um, and about 10, well, almost exactly 10 years ago, founded the Boston Child Study Center um, and have been sort of building out uh, the practices ever since. And when you say practices, you got more than one location? Uh, yeah, so we've got uh, three, we're in three states at the moment. Um, started out in Massachusetts, uh, BCSC Boston, we have locations in Back Bay, uh, Natick and Worcester. Uh, we've also got uh, locations in Portland, Maine and Los Angeles. Wow, that's fantastic. Why don't you tell me a little bit more about, you know, what you do at the Boston Child Study Center? Sure. So, uh, so we are a group of providers um, we specialize in evidence-based treatment for youth uh, mental health uh, struggles, uh, specifically suicidality, self-harm, trauma, anxiety, depression. Um, and uh, we, we've kind of sort of developed a bit of a niche for ourselves in, in that we work with families that um, tend to get referred to us by other clinics and centers and hospitals. So we work with a lot of high acuity, high complexity, uh, and that's kind of forced us to to develop some, some very flexible, comprehensive sort of treatment approaches so that we can make sure that we can serve every family uh, in need. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about the scaffolding of the different levels of service that the Boston Child Study Center is able to provide. Uh, so um, traditional outpatient uh, mental health care uh, is typically structured to be somewhere, you know, 45, 50 minutes once a week. We don't really don't have any science behind why that is. It's just how for Freud sort of did it back in the day, and we haven't really broken free from that since. Uh, our our sort of mental health uh, levels of care typically uh, service folks at the outpatient level, what's called the intensive outpatient program level, you know, roughly eight to 10 hours a week. And then there's usually the day program, partial hospital, roughly 30 hours a week. And then we move into residential and inpatient care. Mm -hmm. at, at Boston Child Study Center, we one of the things we really try to offer is traditional outpatient, once, twice, three times a week uh, outpatient care that can flex uh, up and down in intensity depending on the need of the of the individual or the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather than transfer from an outpatient clinic to an IOP program to a partial hospital program and then transfer back down. Uh, depending on need, we're able to sort of um, flex in what we what we can offer a family. So, for example, if I'm working with uh, an adolescent, um, I can I can sort of move from seeing them once or twice a week to three or four, maybe five times a week. Another member of my team might be able to offer some skills training, uh, exposure coaching, academic, executive function coaching support. So we can offer everywhere between two and and twenty twenty five hours a week of care. And as things stabilize, we can sort of fade off of, or those coaches can sort of um, begin to kind of taper down. And the core treatment team, the the individual therapist, uh, the the group leaders, and the, the the parent coaches and family therapists sort of stay consistent. So the, the the kids is not starting and stopping and starting and stopping over and over again, which we really feel contributes to that kind of revolving door of of relapse and recidivism. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, obviously the name is the Boston Child Study Center. So is it primarily children and teens that that the, mm -hmm. the Child Study Center works with? Or do you know, do you, you know, focus also on, you know, 18 plus in adulthood? 
Yeah, uh, great question. So we sir, we work with kids two to we 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 say twenty five plus. Um, we definitely don't cut folks off at eighteen. Uh, we feel that if you're a young person and you're still struggling with some sort of mental health issue within the context of your family uh, or caregiver system, mm-hmm. whether that be I'm still living at home or I'm still relying on my my family emotionally or financially, we tend to be. Uh, a good site to work with because we're we're going to sort of work with all parts of your life. Um, whereas if you're living on your own, you're kind of, you're flowing the coop, uh, you're struggling with some things here and there, maybe at work or in your relationship. And it's really outside of, you know, that, that broader family system. Um, we, we tend to refer some of those folks to more traditional adult outpatient clinics. So you mentioned, you know, part of the example that you gave working with the teenager, kind of having, you know, the the group, the skills, all of these different kind of pieces um, to triage the needs that, you know, this this individual may have. Is that kind of the, the standard treatment of practice, like starting with an assessment and then kind of developing a whole team to really support, you know, the individual in need? Is that is that kind of how the, the onboarding process or, you know, assessment? Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that. So we a, a lot of what we do has been has has evolved as a as an answer to various problems that we've observed in the way things tend to be done in the mental health space. Uh, so in other clinics I've worked, uh, when a when a client calls, uh, they're sort of screened and then assigned to obviously a clinician within that area of specialty, but whoever has the the next opening. Uh, we 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 add a step in that process. So we have an intake or initial. Uh, consult clinicians who every family meets with, and we're not only trying to figure out what's going on so we can pair them with the right type of treatment, mm-hmm. but also the right dose of treatment, and then who stylistically or interpersonally is likely to be the best fit for that kid, <clears throat> um, which is we found to be critical given the average family who comes uh, through our doors has seen on average 10, 11 therapist programs before coming to us. So the trust in the and the sort of burnout in the mental health system is is usually pretty high. So getting that that style fit uh right can can really make a difference in uh you know creating a little bit of hope that this might be different and that and that they can trust this this provider to to get them through this. Yeah. So do you think that that's kind of one of the biggest misconceptions in the mental health kind of industry and field right now is that that lack of hope that like they've gone through so many therapists kind of thinking like, all right, well, what's one more? It, it may not work. Is that something that you hear often? Oh yeah. Um, and, and I don't think it's unjustified. Uh, when, when my personal friends and family reach out to me, uh, say I'm, I'm from New York and they reach out and they say, Ryan, you know, I'm struggling. Uh, is there anybody you can recommend? I, it, I usually, reach a little bit of a point of sort of dread and angst because it's, there's so much variability and inconsistency within the mental health space. You know, if I'm going to a cardiologist in one state versus another, one of those providers may have a better reputation, maybe, maybe, you know, better well-known or more advanced in what they're doing, but they're all practicing more or less the same thing, cardiology. The, the variability and inconsistency in our field just, I think, contributes to even more of the stigma, more of the frustration, more of the hopelessness. So being able to offer a really consistent mm-hmm. evidence-based treatment model um, is is something that we really you know strive to to make clear and transparent and 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 also flexible. Uh, once a week, and if you need more, you need to get referred somewhere else is not flexible. So we really try to offer everything a kid or a family might need under one roof, whether it be not just individual therapy or academic support for the kid, but caregiver coaching, family therapy, couples therapy, wow. uh, all these things can can usually really contribute to whatever is driving the underlying suffering for any given kid or family. Yeah. I imagine that really helps too with the continuation of services, just having you know, everything housed in one spot so that the family is not feeling like they may fall kind of fall by the wayside, knowing that there's there's other clinicians or or, you know, having to to go to one clinic or lose track of appointments, just knowing everything is kind of housed in one spot. I imagine that's probably what's made the Boston Child Study, you know, Boston Child Study Center successful um, in, in continuing those services. It's definitely one of the things families uh, appreciate and give us feedback on. Um, 
and it's also something we're striving to to do better. Uh, we we're recently building out a, a disordered eating program, so uh, we're ho- hoping in the near future to add to not only nutrition uh, and dietitians on the team, primary care, uh, to sort of round out uh, and and be able to you know even just check in with your primary care physician within the BCSC team so that families can know and trust that that these providers are communicating. They're all operating under one roof, under a similar philosophy, um, and and that's the other thing is, we're a we're a group practice, uh, and we, we we so we try to operate with the flexibility for our staff uh, that a, that a typical group practice might offer, while also sort of uh, adhering to a lot of the, the the training and development you'd find at an academic medical center. So we're rounding. Uh, engaging in professional development training, seminars, et cetera, uh, multiple times a week. So our teams are constantly collaborating like like one would expect at, at a more traditional academic medical center. And that's another thing that I think really adds to the quality of care. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So talk to me a little bit about how you've been able to grow, you know, just starting from from one, you know, location of practice in Boston to now having, it sounds like three in Boston. Now you're in Maine and you're in LA. Talk to me about what that growth looked like. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it, it certainly wasn't planned uh, in in any sort of traditional sense. Uh, a lot of people ask me, "What's your business model?" I don't have one. Uh, never have. Uh, started back in 2013. It was just myself as a solo provider, and sort of built a, a wait list from there, and 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 hired and brought folks on uh, as the demand required. Uh, the expansion to LA and Portland, Maine is two very different places I get asked a lot about. And if I'm being honest, we could probably throw a pin anywhere in the map uh, and find a need uh, where mental health issues are being really underserved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and the, 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 what drew us to those two cities, if I'm being totally honest, was just partners who I trusted, who I've worked with, who I know their work. Uh, and and felt like I, I could I could work with this uh, you know partner uh, really well and and trust that we're going to do the great work in LA and Maine that that we've been doing in Boston all along. Yeah, was there anything that you've learned over the course of you know building the business over the last ten years that that really stood out to you? Oh my God, um, uh, I think um, one thing I've learned is that. Sort of, sort of being an entrepreneur, starting your own business is a little bit like, in my opinion, going to grad school. You should only do it if you have to. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I got a graduate degree because I had to do it to to get licensed to do what I I loved. Uh, and I and I started these businesses after working in many great places who did a lot right, and also seeing a lot of things that I just felt like that doesn't make sense. We could do this in a way that makes much more sense for the family, is much more flexible without all the red tape and, and without all the unethical micromanagings of managed care. So we can we can offer affordable treatment no matter what a family socioeconomic background is without any undue influence from managed care. Uh, and, and we tend to be the cheapest clinic in every city that we're in, mm-hmm. uh, despite being a fee-for-service practice because our sliding scale accounts for every socioeconomic uh, demographic that, that, that we're trying to help that, yeah. that are in every city. I think you raise a really interesting point. Um, I have my I have my my MSW, so we're we're talking the same language here. <laughs> but uh, well, I uh, in in one of my I think it was in grad school. One of my professors raised the point saying that you know like mental health has no area code or mer- uh, mental health has no zip code. Being able to kind of meet everybody where that they are, no matter what socioeconomic status, no matter what you know immigration status or, or disability, what have you, being able to meet people where they're at is so huge. And I think that's a common misconception too in, in the industry is that it's not accessible. And knowing that you have such a range of services, being able to support the family and kind of, you know, that whole systems-based approach, making sure you're you're meeting them as a whole unit down to the individual level, you know, working with the couples and all of that, I think it's a it's a crucial part of the practice. Yeah, we, we'd certainly strive to make every level of care as accessible as possible. Um, and it's it's a little bit different, uh, or very different, I should say, in each city uh, so far. Um, the the families as a whole in in Boston tend to be very well uh, aware of what evidence based treatment is, and they're just looking for, uh, you know, where they can get it, where they can get it soon, especially if they're in crisis. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in 
in Maine, uh, there's a lot less, uh, far, far less available. Um, uh, so being able to offer cutting edge evidence-based treatment to those families has been, uh, really exciting. Uh, and, and in Los Angeles, it's a little bit different. I, I think there's so much noise in that market and, and it's oversaturated with so many pseudoscience providers. There's a, a, a healthy skepticism that we see in a lot of families who've been burned by a, a lot of these, um, not so research science-based treatments. So there's almost like a, 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 a re-education and, and building of trust process that, that we go through with those folks very justifiably given what's, what's, uh what's going on in, in that particular part of the country. Yeah, yeah. And I think you raise a, an interesting point that I imagine all three of those separate practices are very different in the needs that they serve, you know, and, and just the families that, that are interacting with. So I think it's, you know, I imagine kind of from your perspective too, that's interesting to look and reflect on each of the practices and see how they're they're continuing to grow and change and scale and kind of adapting to that as well. Yeah, uh, like I said earlier, we we've never had a business model, so I have no idea what size any of these practices will or won't grow to. It's really just trying to meet the the needs in each community, mm-hmm. um, whether it be hearing from families or or where we've built uh, sort of the the foundation of our 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 center is is really most of our referrals in Massachusetts come from other clinics and centers uh, that you know you might traditionally think of as competition are really you know, looking for, for collaboration and help with, with families that have been through a lot and, and a lot of treatment and, um, and really need that sort of wraparound level of care to, to make sure that the, the treatment journey kind of stops here. Mm-hmm. Would you say, you know, the, the clients that you're working with, the individuals and the families, are there trends in the, I don't want to say like the main core presenting issues, um, I guess that may be the best way to ask. Is it primarily like mental health, substance abuse? Is there is autism? Like, talk to me a little bit about that. Um, so one of our mo- one of our biggest uh, services is dialectical behavior therapy, um, which is a, a treatment for severe emotion dysregulation, suicidality, self harm, uh, as well as substance use and and you know disordered eating, uh, anxiety, depression, and trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of our sort of areas of expertise that we're most well known for is working with the most uh, sort of acute, complex uh, youth and families. Uh, So that's certainly an area that we're very well known for and that other centers tend to look to us uh, as a referral uh, for. Uh, That said, we also do really great work with younger kids, lower acuity, more traditional anxiety disorders, uh, disruptive behaviors, uh, et cetera. Um, So in, in, in short, we we work with really the full continuum of mental health uh, concerns. Um, and while, while we're known for the sort of highly acute where we're also looking uh, to sort of uh, make the public, make, make uh, the community aware that, that we've got a lot to offer for lower acuity uh, kids and families so that we can intervene a lot earlier and, and not be the, not be the 11th stop, but hopefully maybe the first or third yeah. You know, stop uh, in their process to to reduce a lot of unnecessary suffering. Yeah. So if people wanted to learn more, you know, about about the Boston Child Study Center, where can they go to learn more information? Uh, so bostonchildstudycenter.com is our, our web page. Uh, we're currently uh, revamping uh, our website uh, to provide more than just the traditional sort of here's what we offer. Here's our process. Uh, we're in a big overhaul right now to to sort of make our website more of a free online uh, sort of e-learning platform, uh, sort of like the Khan Academy for you know emotions, uh, if you will. So uh, that that those changes are in the works. So so for for information about what we do and and how to get connected with us, BostonChildStudyCenter.com, uh, and and we're excited to to sort of you know um, share more about about this sort of new new developing uh, a website that we hope to to I- increase access and help further decrease stigma so so people can kind of engage with this material in a, in a more um, confidential way in the privacy of their own home. And I think that that's a really interesting point to that knowledge that people can do kind of their own research on outside of time, outside of the offices, kind of getting to know. And like you said, just being a little more accessible to break down that stigma, work on that education. I think that's, you know, it's a great it's a great um, I'm going to call it an initiative, but it's a great move that, you know, the company is making to, to work on furthering that education. So 
Dr. Madigan, this has been a great conversation. Before we head out, is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with either, you know, about the Boston Child Study Center, about mental health in in, in your experience or anything that you want to leave our listeners with? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, it's a little cliche, but I think, you know, a lot of folks have lost uh, hope. Um, and uh, one of the biggest things families tell us is that our approach to mental health conditions is very, very different. Uh, rather than viewing emotions as symptoms uh, and viewing more traditional symptoms as part of a disorder or disease, we really believe that that when we help our clients sort of reconnect with or or, or um, change their relationship to their emotions, uh, most of the suffering uh, will subside, uh, and and that we're we're taking more of an emotion focused approach. So even if you're a client who's received CBT or DBT in the past, most of the families we work with, you know, share with us that that after completing our, our program, it just does not feel like the more behaviorally focused or skills focused programs uh, that they've received in the past. So I guess I'd encourage families to kind of keep their minds open and no matter how many times they've been burned or let down by the system, that that's a lot of what we're trying to answer. And and we look forward to, to the opportunity to kind of share a little bit about what we hope we can help help them with. I think that's fantastic. A, a, a piece of a uh, piece of information and kind of advice to, to leave our listeners with. Well, Dr. Madigan, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate you taking the time to break down, you know, kind of all of the different offerings that the Boston Child Study Center does, you know, all of the, the different programs, initiatives, your growth, um, being able to just be on business and just today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. 